predicament is universal tragic estrangement from one's true being. We're glad that you're with us for worship today. I have a big announcement. I'm very excited. I've been waiting for this for about a year. But starting on April 4th with Easter, we're going to be gathering in person, outdoor in our garden for worship to celebrate resurrection. And then the week after that, we're going to worship again. And the week after that, and after that, we are going to be gathering weekly again, 10 a.m. Sunday morning. We're going to be outside for a while, and we have the space in here. We've been working hard. We can't wait to welcome everyone back inside, but we'll get there. We're starting with just getting back into the rhythm of in-person worship every week. We are going to be continuing to have uh, some digital content available for you on Sundays as well, including the sermon scripture announcements. So if you're at a distance, you'll still be able to uh, uh, stick with us and know what's going on. So I'm really, really excited for that. Please make sure you go to risehere.org and let us know if you're going to be able to join us for Easter. Um, numbers are very important. If we have a lot of people to make sure we have space for physical distancing, we will add another service if we have to, but we need to know who's going to be here with us. And then also there's going to be an Easter egg hunt for the kids. Got to know how many eggs to have out there. There's going to be a ton. Um, let us know. Sign up your kids. That would be awesome. So I cannot wait to see you uh, so soon. All right, let's take a moment and pray. And then Jordan's going to lead us in a couple songs. And then we'll hear from Pastor Matt this morning. If you'll pray with me. God, we thank you for your grace and love and life that is all around us. Give us eyes to see and make our hands be for uh, your purposes and, and what you're doing in the world for, for loving others, God. We ask that your spirit will fill us through worship today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pass over to you, Jordan. Blessings. We're glad that you're joining us this morning. So it was a pleasure to be here and worship with you wherever you're at, at home, at work. Our first song is called Defender. It's one of my favorite songs to sing. It just speaks on the presence of God being present even when uh, you feel lost and there's no hope. So sing it with me. Thank you. 
you go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call in my victory. go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my greatest defense. It leads me from the dry wilderness. And all I did was I did was worship, and all I did was bow down, and all I did was sit still, and I So much better your way And hallelujah Great defender So much better your way You know before I do When my heart can see To find your truth, your mercy is the shade I'm living in. You restore my faith and hope again. And all I did was pray. And all I did was worship. bow down and all I did was stay still and hallelujah you have saved me so much better better your way hallelujah and hallelujah you have saved me so much better your way and hallelujah great defender so much better your way When I thought I lost me, you know where I left me, you reintroduced me to your love. You picked up all my pieces, put me back together, you are the defender of my heart. And when I thought I lost together you are the defender of my heart and hallelujah you have saved me so much better your way and 
surrender And now I want to know to know So Pastor Ben has been having a real good time at my expense. He's been talking every week about how big of a bummer it is that I've picked these awful scriptures for him and I've saved the best for me. Well, Pastor Ben ain't going to like it today because today is going in the same direction because we all know the song. We all know the song. What song might you ask? It's a song we all learned when we were in Sunday school. And it goes, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. See, we all know that song so well, I bet you're singing along with me in your home. You're probably already into the second line. When I was a children's pastor at La Mesa First, I would often... Uh, this would end up being my favorite game because I'd make the song into a game and I'd sing the wrong lyrics just to mess with the kids and I would say, Zacchaeus was a wee little pup and they'd go, no! And I'd say, wait, what did I say wrong? And they'd say, no, he's a wee little man. And we'd go along and I'd change the words and shortly they would tell me the whole story of Jesus and Zacchaeus in their own words. But here's the thing, the song doesn't really tell the whole story, does it? There isn't a verse about people spitting on Zacchaeus because of his job. There there isn't a verse about how he probably didn't have any friends. There, There isn't a verse about how hated he was by literally everyone. The song doesn't tell the story of separation. Remember, for Paul Tillich, our theologian for the sermon series, he says that separation is another word for sin. And Zacchaeus had committed some. He admits to them. He repents of them eventually in the story. So you're going to listen to a story of repentance as well. You're going to hear a story of reunion as well. And remember, Tillich uses that word in place of grace sometimes. But it does tell the story. It doesn't tell the whole story, but it does tell the story of someone whose life had fallen apart and being found by one who loves him as he is. It tells the story of the one who finds us when everything is falling apart. So as you hear it read, listen for the hope that comes from being found. The scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be a guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, 
Half my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the story of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're in the middle of a sermon series between Trinity North Park and Rise Escondido, but today's story begins at my first week here at Trinity. Because what Rise wouldn't know, and maybe not even the people of Trinity know, is that Trinity was my first gig as a senior pastor. And so I had spent 10 years working at, in the second chair at La Mesa First, and I got to do a lot of playing pastor in my role there. The pastors would go out of town, and I'd be in charge of the staff meeting and preaching and teaching the Bible studies, and it'd be like that for a couple of weeks, but always with the safety net of a pastor, the senior pastor was going to come back and take care of anything I missed and take care of anything that I didn't do quite right. But my first day here, I remember the fear and anxiety. I walked into the sanctuary, I'm not joking here, I walked into the sanctuary at 5.30 in the morning for a 10.15 worship service. And I sat in this space, and I actually sat in the chair behind the pulpit for at least an hour praying to God because I had this sense that it all just got real. All the playing pastor that I had done, it kind of, was kind of felt like playing doctor and then going and being a doctor. There was so much of that, and the weight of leadership overcame me. And there was a certain separation that I felt by being the leader of a congregation, recognizing some of the distance, some of the separation. And I felt so alone for just a little while, and then the people of Trinity started to arrive. And I was welcomed, and it was clear that these people were going to love me. And day after day after day after day, as this congregation got to know me, as this congregation got to know my faults, as public as they can be, and to be fair to myself, as you got to know some of my strengths as well, you got to see the clear picture and you got to know me authentically. I would say you began to see me, not just my position as a pastor, but you got to see the person, Matt. And you proved to me over and over and over again that you were going to love me no matter what happened here. And it was in that being seen with all of my faults, being known, and ultimately being loved, that all of that fear, anxiety, and loneliness that I felt that first day just crumbled away into nothing. It empowered me to go and live my best life of faith, knowing that I was loved and supported just like I am. I have to think that that's how Zacchaeus felt that day that Jesus sees him, the man small of stature in the top of that tree. The song, it makes fun of his height, but we know that that's not why people hated him. They hated him because he was a tax collector. His people, the people of Israel, they knew that his job, his, his purpose for living at the moment, the way he made his wages, the way he got rich, as the scripture says, was by taking money from them, 
to feed the war horse of the Roman Empire, knowing that that same war horse had come into Palestine and made servants and slaves of them all, had overtaken a land that was a gift directly from their God, Yahweh. So not only was Zacchaeus doing something that made them miserable, like taking their resources, he was doing it for the same people who had smashed the heads of their fathers and their fathers before them and would eventually smash the heads of their own children. So, definitely not loved by the the people of Israel. I don't know this to be true, but I just really do assume as he walked down the street, this little man, I just assume he was getting spit on. And then you have the Romans, the people who he works for. No matter how rich he gets, no matter how much good work he does for those Romans... He's not going to be Roman. He's still going to be a Palestinian Jew, a son of Abraham, as Jesus says. So on one hand, he is completely hated by the people of his birth, and on the other hand, he's hated by the people he's chosen by career. That is separated, and that is lonely. You can almost imagine the casual excitement that Zacchaeus might have felt when he hears that there is a prophet that eats with sinners. Maybe me. But he doesn't really go there yet. Not only does he eat with sinners, he, he really afflicts the, the, the Pharisees, the people who call me a sinner to my face, Maybe, and again, he can't quite find the hope yet. He can't quite find the hope of the moment, can he? So he stays at a distance. He runs way up ahead. He finds a tree so he can see over the crowd and remain again separated from them. And Jesus comes by, and Zacchaeus gets what he wants because he sees Jesus. But something far more important than his seeing Jesus happens. Because Jesus sees him. And not just the Zacchaeus of the song. He sees Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Zacchaeus, the sinner. Zacchaeus, the despised one. And Jesus makes a decision that I'm not sure that most of us would make. Because Jesus says, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm coming to your house today. Should I sing it? Zacchaeus, you come down. Be with us. Because I'm going to your house today. I'm going to have a meal with you. You've heard that I eat with sinners. Today it is your turn, and I don't call you a sinner. So Zacchaeus comes down, and I can't help but think that the separation begins to fall away right there. That loneliness of being someone so despised starts to fall away right there because uh, in the in Methodist circles we have to use this term it's it's like the law we have to at least throw it in a sermon at least once or twice a year like John Wesley saying his heart was strangely warmed we can see Zacchaeus's heart strangely warmed and inspired because when the crowd says and they do how dare this Jesus eat with sinners like him, Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give away half of everything I have. And if I've ever defrauded anyone, 
I'm going to pay back four times. Four times what I took. Four times. All because Jesus saw him, all of his faults, all of his fears, all of his being despised and loved him. And his separation and loneliness fell away because it wasn't the true story. It was always a false narrative. Because remember what we keep saying from our theologian of the series, Paul Tillich. That Paul Tillich says that God is the ground of all being. If we were not held by God and connected by God's love, then we wouldn't even exist. That's powerful. I've got to even just stop there. Even three sermons in for me, three sermons in for me, I can't help but be touched by how held and loved we are by a God who created us. And when, when God created us, never let go. Never let go of us. As we tried to pull away and run away from God's love, God pulled us in closer. God sends grace even when we reject it. That is the kind of love that we see in Jesus. That's the kind of love we see that says, come down. Don't, don't be so far. Come sit at the table with me. The ground of being means that we cannot be separated from God. But, but here's where it gets really more complicated. Because if we are all held and loved by our Creator God constantly, because God is the ground of being, then that means that through God we are connected to one another as well. There's no way for us to be alone and abandoned and separated in any eternal sense, in any real sense. There is no way for us to be separated and alienated from each other. Because God binds us together. God binds the whole universe together within God's love. That means that my heart is bound to God, and it means my heart is bound to you. So we can't be separate from each other. We can only try to be separate from each other. That running away stuff that we do, the running away from the woundedness of, of, of broken relationships. We can only try to be separate, but it's not possible in the deepest, most creative senses of our God. St. Augustine said, Our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. Part of that rest has to come from stopping the struggle, stopping the self-imposed alienations, and seeking those repaired relationships. The rest comes, that moment of rest comes from knowing the truth that we cannot truly be separated from one another. We cannot be separated from the love of God or one another. That love is inescapable by God's very nature. So Pastor Ben last week when he talked about something very similar, but in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, The rich man never did see how he was connected to Lazarus as a fellow human, as a beloved child of God. He always saw him from a position of alienation and separation. The rich man tried, even in Hades, to pull himself away from someone like Lazarus. And Ben said, 
I don't like it, but I think it's true. I don't like it, but I think it's true. Because because it's true means that Lazarus' wounds are my wounds. If we're connected, then your wounds are my wounds, and my wounds are yours. So Ben says he doesn't like it, but he thinks it's true. And today I say that if God is the ground of being, then we can't be separate from one another. I don't know it's true, but let me tell you one thing. I need it. In order to follow Jesus, I need it. I don't think the gospel makes sense without it. So I don't know it's true, but I need it more than anything. I need to know that I'm always connected and bound by the love of God that surrounds and holds the entire universe. God's love binds us and is boundless. We can take that as the biggest comfort that is possible in this entire world because restoration is not only possible. Reunion is not only possible. It is God's will. It is the way that God made everything. So no matter where you are today, no matter where your spirit is, or, or like we like to ask each other, how is it with your soul? No matter where your soul is today, you feel alone or alienated, separated, hurting. There is a God who holds you, whose love binds you, not only to God's own self, not only to God's spirit and God's son, but also to one another. That alienation that you might feel is a false narrative, and God can heal us. And so let us pray. God, we thank you for your love that is boundless, that is reckless. We thank you for the love that binds my heart to you, our hearts to you, our hearts to one another. God, may our hearts remain restless until they find their rest in you because we ask that you would show us how to stop struggling against you and against your love and better connect with you and with one another. We ask all these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Lexology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Ah, ah, amen. Ah,